Hello, my name is Corey Malcolm. I am the Director of Archaeology for the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum in Key West, Florida. Our organization is a not-for-profit research center and education facility, and, and uh, we're focused on the study of maritime heritage, uh, especially uh, maritime archaeology, uh, the, uh, the archaeology of shipwrecks, if you will. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting an overview of a research project that we have been involved in for many years, and that is the search for the pirate slave ship Guerrero. Guerrero was a ship that was involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, the transatlantic slave trade was a maritime system in which captive African people were shipped from the west coast of Africa uh, across the Atlantic Ocean to the American colonies where they were put into uh, slavery. It was a system that ran for a long time, about 350 years. Uh, some 12 million captive African people were caught up in it and uh, forced to sail on what's been estimated as 36,000 slave ships. Um, it was a massive system that really uh, uh, shaped the world. It was a massive economic engine. Uh, it, it was instrumental in the development of agriculture, uh, in mining, in other industries, especially here in the Americas. And by transporting millions of people across the ocean, uh, it had profound social impacts, both then and now. Guerrero operated at a time when the transatlantic slave trade had been outlawed. Uh, the ship was operating as a pirate ship. The wreck of Guerrero, the remains that might be found, uh, can offer not only a snapshot into the history of that time, but they can also uh, illustrate the tangible realities of the transatlantic slave trade. Quite literally, uh, at the, the wreck sites, there should be the nuts and bolts of a slave ship. Uh, this work that I'm going to be talking about here, um, this has been uh, the effort of many. Uh, we have partnered with quite a few groups over the years on this project, and I think I can say on behalf of all of us that we are honored, uh, we are proud to be uh, uh, moving the story of Guerrero forward in some way. I know that uh, I am especially pleased to be presenting this research overview to you, and I hope that you find it uh, interesting. I hope you find it informative, um, and uh, uh, you know it, it will will help. I think bring an understanding to uh, not just this shipwreck, but what the slave trade was in general. So. Uh, let's uh, get going and learn a little bit more about the wreck of the pirate slave ship Guerrero. This project overview begins in 2002 when I gave a lecture about the wreck of the slave ship Henrietta Marie in Key Largo. Afterwards, I was approached by two men, Dennis Trelowitz and Chuck Hayes, and they explained to me that they were heading up a team called the Submerged Resources Inventory Team, and they were uh, volunteering with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary to document submerged cultural resources in the upper Florida Keys. They explained that they uh, had been looking for a shipwreck uh, of a slave ship called the Guerrero, and they just had not been able to uh, pinpoint where it might be. And they were curious, asking if uh, our team might be interested in partnering with them to help locate this shipwreck site. And uh, 
After some meetings back and forth, uh, uh, we all agree that yes, uh, uh, it would be uh, uh, a good thing to partner and begin searching for the wreck of the pirate slave ship Guerrero. Um, this has since uh, run for many years and has involved uh, many other partners and uh, has been a, a very interesting, informative, and uh, rewarding project. On December 19, 1827, Guerrero wrecked near Carey's Fort Reef in the upper Florida Keys while being chased by the British Navy schooner Nimble. Guerrero was an illegal slaver carrying 561 captive African people. Both ships hit the reef. Guerrero was a total loss and never sailed again. 41 of the African people on board drowned. Guerrero was originally the brig James Monroe and was built in 1813 in New London, Connecticut. It was 323 tons and 110 feet long. The vessel was based originally in New York City and shortly after launch was granted a letter of mark and made a privateer in the War of 1812. It sailed between France and the United States and preyed on British shipping with great success. The vessel's last documented voyage as James Monroe was to France in 1817. Somehow, James Monroe ended up in Cuba and under the command of the pirate Jose Gomez. Between 1825 and 1827, it operated under the names Pepe, San Jose, and Guerrero. Multiple times, the pirate crew sailed to Africa, robbed ships, and acquired people to sell. In 1827, nearly 600 Africans were put on board. Guerrero then sailed for Cuba. On December 19, 1827, the Royal Navy schooner Nimble was patrolling near Orange Key in the Bahamas, looking for illegal slavers. Guerrero was sighted and Nimble attempted to stop it. The ship sailed westward, a battle began, night fell, and both smashed into the Florida Reef. Guerrero was bilged and rolled on its side. Nimble grounded too, but jettisoned iron ballast and iron shot to float free. Shortly after, its anchor line parted and the schooner grounded again. The next morning, 90 pirates and the surviving Africans were rescued by wreckers. Nimble was refloated and towed to safety. That night, the pirates hijacked two of the wrecking vessels and got away to Cuba with 400 Africans. The remaining Africans were delivered to the United States authorities at Key West. Guerrero was salvaged. Its goods were auctioned, including guns, anchors, gold dust, cloth, and elephant's tusks. The events were big news and well documented. But for the purposes of this study, where it all took place became the primary question. The best location for the events comes from the nimble log entry of December 20th, and it says, slipped the best bower cable and came to in two and a half fathoms, carries Fort Light Vessel south by west, one half west, and Black Sarah's Creek north one half east. Once the locations of Black Sarah's Creek and the lightship were determined, factoring in weather and other variables from historical accounts, three reefs were determined the likeliest to have been the strike points. Two in the northern part of the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and one in the southern end of Biscayne National Park. The areas in the National Marine Sanctuary were outlined for investigation. Beginning in 2003 and partnering with the RPM Nautical Foundation, we spent three summers conducting magnetometer surveys. 
there was a lot of going back and forth in close travel lanes, collecting magnetic data within the areas of interest. These surveys revealed many anomalies, nearly 90 overall. Three of those, though, have proved especially interesting. The first is an anchor in 12 feet of water. We know Nimble lost an anchor in two fathoms. The second is a reef littered with iron ballast and shot, just as Nimble described throwing overboard. And the third is a shipwreck on the edge of the reef in eight to 12 feet of water. When these sites were plotted, they seemed to agree with the historical record concerning Guerrero and Nimble, but really further investigation was necessary to discern their details. In 2010, a partnership between the Mel Fisher Maritime Museum, the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, the Submerged Resources Inventory Team, the National Association of Black Scuba Divers and the Diving with a Purpose program uh, all came together to explore and map the sites. At the shipwreck site, uh, no excavation was conducted, but a baseline and triangulation system was used to document all of the materials scattered across the surface. Everything that was visible was documented across the entirety of the site. In 2012, another research partnership was formed to explore the shipwreck, this time between our museum, the Diving with a Purpose program, and the National Marine Sanctuary. We worked for three days to explore the site, uh, looking for clues uh, about its mission, its identity, as well as further evidence of how it was distributed. A site plan was developed from these various surveys and it shows the shipwreck to be a scattered debris field, roughly 300 by 350 feet. Many different things have been seen across the site during these surveys, including stone ballast. Now, these are literally just rocks underwater. Why is that exciting? Well, in the Florida Keys, the only natural rock is limestone or even coral rubble. Um, and these are neither, meaning they had to be brought in from somewhere else. And in this case, the shipwreck. Iron ballast blocks are seen on the site too, as are iron fasteners, such as pins and spikes. Many, many copper spikes are found strewn across the wreck site. Some driven into the limestone sea bottom, others with remnants of the ship's wood still fused underneath their head. Remnants of copper sheathing are found scattered across the wreck as well. Some remnants of plates fused to the sea bottom, others crumpled wads. A large number of copper sheathing tacks are found as well. There are also areas where multiple iron objects are fused together in masses on the sea bottom. It's difficult to discern the details in these conglomerates, but we have seen iron fasteners, iron ballast blocks, cargo hooks, and rigging thimbles in these features. Amongst the individual iron artifacts found around the site is a plain flat iron bar, roughly three feet long, this piece looks suspiciously like voyage iron, a type of trade good often found in the African trade. 
This encrusted iron loop has been identified as a futtock plate. Futtock plates were part of the ship's standing rigging, and they held dead eyes that served as attachment points for the shroud lines that supported and stabilized the top mast. Here is a triangular iron brace, perhaps a device called a plate knee, which would have been used to reinforce where the deck and knees of the ship came together. If so, this is a post 1790s invention. One small piece of wood has been found on the site, a piece roughly 18 inches long. It was associated with copper spikes and an iron pin, so it is uh, certainly from the shipwreck. A small sample of this wood was collected and analyzed, and it proved to be white oak from the Northern Hemisphere. Many earthenware bricks have been found, likely remnants of the ship's hearth. Lead shot, musket shot. This is important because we know Guerrero carried muskets. Here is an example of an uncommon type of flat-ended iron bar shot from the wreck. This type of shot is generally found in Spanish contexts and it's called a palanqueta. Uh, to the right, you can see a drawing of different sizes of palanquetas from the Spanish archives. Many years ago, and before our involvement in the project, an iron round shot was recovered from the wreck. This was conserved and is now in the State of Florida Archaeological Collection. This ball is important because it is a 12 pound cannonball and that is significant because Guerrero carried 14 brass cannons and all of them fired 12 pound shot. A small brass and glass piece was initially thought to be an eyepiece or part of some sort of ocular device. But research shows that it looks more like it could be part of a reliquary. And if so, it once held a religious relic and is an item that is generally associated with Catholicism. A pewter artifact was initially thought to be an inkwell, but it had no evidence of a bottom. Further research has instead shown that it is the end cap from an enema syringe. A number of glass pieces found on the wreck have been especially informative. Here you see a large bottleneck as it was found on the sea bottom. This piece was recovered and conserved. It is from a large Demijohn bottle with a laid on string rim, and it dates from the 18th to early 19th centuries. This is the neck and rim from a wine bottle. The rim and lip designs on bottles like this change through time, uh, and these styles can be sequenced using uh, both historical and archaeological evidence. This particular style is known to date from between 1819 and 1840. Here is the base from a rummer type drinking glass. This is a style of vessel that dates from the mid 18th to early 19th centuries. The neck and rim of a delicate glass vial. It matches closely with the eau de cologne type vial. The intact example on the right is from 1811. 
a piece of lead glazed sandy pasted earthenware is similar to a type of Spanish ceramic known as El Moro ware. A hard, glossy, bright white ceramic appears to be either fine china or bone china, an English form of porcelain first used in the mid to late 18th century. Another type of ceramic seen on the wreck is called blue edge or feather edge pearlware, and it is also a type of English ceramic. It is of a variety with an undulating rim and embossed with grass, wheat, and daisies. This particular design saw its greatest use in the 1820s. So in looking at all of the evidence, what can we say about this shipwreck? Well, it's certainly the wreck of a sailing vessel. The rigging elements make that clear. And though it is badly broken, battered, and scattered, the site represents a vessel that was a total loss. There's simply too much essential gear from the top of the ship to the bottom found on the sea floor. As a group, the artifacts date to the early 19th century. The ship was sheathed with copper, which is important because we know from the historical record that Guerrero was sheathed with copper. It carried 12 pound cannon shot, but no cannons. Again, important because Guerrero carried all 12 pound guns and all of those guns were salvaged. There are no anchors on the site. All of Guerrero's anchors were salvaged. We do see musket shot. We know Guerrero carried muskets. We see what looks to be perhaps a mix of cultures, at least uh, English and Spanish. Um, what that means entirely isn't clear at the moment. Unfortunately, there's nothing directly attributable to Guerrero, nothing with a name on it. Um, but what we have learned from this site is that artifacts tend to come and go as storms pass through. So um, there is additional wreckage that is buried that has not been seen. And perhaps uh, as more storms come through, uh, some additional items will be revealed and, and uh, we'll be able to learn a bit more about the shipwreck. Let's look at the other sites. At uh, the second site, there is an anchor. It is of the appropriate size, date, and design to have been used by the British Navy schooner Nimble. Um, and it's in the right place and it's in the right depth of water for uh, an anchor that they recorded losing. But unfortunately, sometimes uh, an anchor is just an anchor. They, they can be uh, generic. So it's hard to make uh, too many big proclamations about this particular piece, but it is certainly um, quite interesting. At the third site, we see iron ballast ingots sitting on a shallow reef. These are associated with multiple iron shots. Here's another example of an iron ballast ingot, uh, three feet long, covered with corals and sponges. This site was also mapped using a baseline and triangulation system. Uh, the site plan generated from this effort shows six iron ballast blocks uh, a seventh has been found since, roughly 20 iron cannon shot, and an area that generates magnetic and metal detector signals, but remains unidentified. This site is exactly as described in Nimble's log, where they jettisoned iron ballast and shot to float free. 
one of the iron shot was recovered and conserved, and it's a 24-pound ball. It was hoped a British broad arrow would be found on it, the mark of the Royal Navy. Instead, there's a circular mark, and it contains a garbled line, and unfortunately, uh, that line is uh, really inconclusive. It doesn't tell us anything. When Nimble entered the Navy service, it was documented as carrying only 18-pound guns. Is the size of this shot then a discrepancy? Well, there are other conflicting accounts of Nimble's armament, so what we know now is that more research is needed to see if there is a definitive answer somewhere out there as to Nimble's artillery. Field work continues at the sites, and uh, most recently, we have been working to document artifacts from all three as they're found on the sea floor. And we're doing this through a technique called 3D photogrammetry. And this involves taking dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of photographs of each object from all conceivable angles, and then blending those together utilizing uh, special 3D rendering software and creating a three-dimensional image that can then be uh, put online and shared with anybody with an internet connection. Here you see an example of this work, a short video clip of a 3D model. This is one of the iron palanquetas, the flat-ended bar shot. Um, but this can be, uh, again, posted online, and uh, anybody who is interested in learning more about these artifacts, about these uh, uh, sites, um, can see these as we see them on the seafloor. It's quite exciting to be able to uh, have this technology. And to take this 3D technology even a step further, these 3D renderings, whether they are of objects on the sea floor or artifacts that have been uh, recovered and conserved, these 3D models can be printed. And that uh, is what you see here. Uh, the models that we made of, of objects from the shipwrecks uh, were utilized by the Florida Public Archaeology Network and the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, they were printed and then used in exhibits. And uh, um, here you see uh, two of the iron shot, a glass bottleneck, a plate rim, all 3D printed um, on display and allowing people to see these pieces um, and understand the shipwrecks uh, a little bit more clearly. And what's really neat is that this can happen simultaneously now in multiple places. So multiple prints can be generated, multiple exhibits developed, and uh, um, people uh, in, in uh, different parts of the uh, community, different parts of the country, of the world even, uh, can have three-dimensional renderings of objects from uh, uh, these sites and learn from them. And that is, uh, again, just uh, uh, such an exciting uh, an idea. Uh, the potential is just now, uh, uh, you know, coming to fruition and, and uh, really what it all means and how it can be used in, in different ways is, is, uh, is still on the learning curve, but uh, the beginning is quite exciting. So now, after all of this exploration, research, and interpretation, where are we? Where does the project stand? Surveys have revealed three sites on one reef that fit the events of 1827 and discounted two other surrounding reefs where nothing comparable was found. To date, the historical and archaeological evidence suggests the shipwreck found in this survey is Guerrero. Nothing eliminates it. And after nearly 15 years since first reporting this site, no other candidate has been found. 
The southernmost reef in Biscayne National Park still needs to be fully investigated, though, and we wait for the Park Service to complete that work and share their results. In the interim, we will continue to seek definitive clues about the sites outlined here, and we will work to bring Guerrero and Nimble into the public's understanding of the history and archaeology of the transatlantic slave trade. This project has been the effort of many, and I want to thank everyone who's helped to move it forward and helped to make this presentation possible. And I want to thank you for listening. If you would like to learn more about our work, I encourage you to visit these online resources, our museum website at melfisher.org, our 3D artifact galleries at sketchfab.com, and written reports are available about this project at academia.edu.